All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started because it is seven o'clock here. Um, so I'm Ashley DeBracho and I'm Program Assistant at National History Day and I just want to thank you so much for joining us for our third webinar in the Legacies of World War I series. And I know that your time is valuable and that you're checking in from many places around the world. So if you can go down to that chat box and tell me where you're signing in from. Megan and Shelly are on top of it. Megan says hello from Richmond, Virginia and Shelly says hi from West Fork, Arkansas. Christopher says hi from Old Lamb, Connecticut. Mackenzie, Tucson, Arizona. Will right, Arizona. Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, look, we got Louisiana. Ooh, you guys are coming at me real fast right now. Centerville, Virginia. Kentucky. Hi, James from Kentucky. Kelly from Iowa. Erica from Seattle, Washington. Joshua from Spokane. Beth from Iowa. Katie from very cold Chicago, Nicole from, I'm going to go with Kansas City on that one. I'm sorry if I butchered that, Nicole. Julia from Utah, Keith from Vermont, Man, uh, Mandy from Louisiana. Oh, Christopher, one Q, I'm still butchering that, from New Jersey. Amy from North Carolina, Jamie from Bangor. Kate from New Jersey, Helene from Indianapolis, Lisa from Little Rock, Arkansas, oh, yeah, here's Craig from Starkville, Mississippi, Heather from South Carolina, Andres from Puerto Rico, Chuck from Milwaukee, <laughs> Elizabeth from uh, Staunton, Virginia, Lisa from California, Scott from Nashville, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Todd from Puerto Rico. I wish I was there. It's very cold here today. It is. <laughs> Wesley from Mississippi. Uh, Matt signing in from South Korea. Matt's a little early. Go back to bed. <laughs> Mark from, is that Indiana? All right. Hi, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First off, I want to say thank you to all of the teachers that were able to join us today at the United States Institute of Peace to talk about World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. It was nice to meet you if you were there. And just tossing this out there to our librarians in the group, if any of you are going to the American Association of School Librarians, come by the National History Day booth and say hi. We'd love to meet you. And also, for anyone going to NCSS, we will be there. So stop by the booth and say hi. So I'm just going to do some really quick wrap up if my computer decides to agree with us and then we will get started. Module four is up. So get reading. Um, Dr. Cavazzola is doing it and it is a nice little juxtaposition to what we're going to learn today. So get ready. Also, go ahead and check out that final assessment. Everyone needs to do it. So go in there and see what uh, you have to do to finish up this course. All right, so tonight we are going to go with regular structure here. We're going to hear uh, from Dr. Benton Cohen on immigration in the World War I period. And of course, if you have questions about anything that she's talking about, send them on down there to the Q&A box and I will go ahead and write them out so that we can do some Q&A a little bit later. And then of course, do not forget, you got to stick around until the end so you can fill out our survey link. That's how you get credit. So don't forget to write down the link and do that. I will be sending it out later on to everyone as well. All right. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I am going to toss this, if I can, to Dr. Renton Cohen. And I'm super excited, so I hope everyone else is on this. All right, make sure I'm doing this right, yeah? Yep, you can go ahead and share your screen. There we go. We are can you all to still go. see me, right? Well, I can still, we can still see you, yes. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much for having me. We don't have a lot of time, and I have a lot of slides, more than I really should. It's not good pedagogy, but I wanted to give you lots of content that you could look at later if you wanted. I'm actually friends with Chris Capazzola, Professor Capazzola. Um, we've both written, actually, about the Bisbee deportation, this event we're going to start with, and you had a reading about. So I'm excited that our content goes together really well. Um, I also have lived in or been to many of the places where you're from. I taught for four years at Louisiana State, so shout out to Louisiana. I am myself from Arizona. 
I have a ninth grade son in the DC public schools who bowed out of doing National History Day so I can relate to the reluctant participants or those who refuse, and I've also judged it at his middle school. So this is really a privilege for me. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I will turn off my face so that you will not be distracted. <laughs> um, and um, let's see, I lost that for a sec, hold on. Screen sharing has stopped, wait. Let's turn me off. Stop video. Got it. There we go. There you go. And then just hit share screen again. Yep. Hmm. You didn't like that. Okay. Here we go. We got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. What I want to do today is kind of zip through um, the context of 1917 up until the quota laws of the 1920s, which really radically transformed immigration flows in the United States. Um, certainly they're not something I learned about when I was um, in grade school, middle school, or even high school, but I think in the current historical moment we can realize how incredibly important it is to understand the history of immigration and immigration policy in the United States. And I would add I teach um, an undergraduate seminar on immigration history and policy and I taught last night and I told my undergraduates that it is difficult to it is difficult to convey the seriousness of the moment that we are in. Um, regardless of where you stand um, on the political spectrum, this is really uncharted waters. Um, I, you can um, ask me questions about this in the Q and A, but I'll give you a generality that will help you understand the World War One legislative context. Um, we have never had a president who was as uniformly hostile to immigration in American history as President Trump. Um, and more to the point, it has until the last 10 or 15 years been um, really a bipartisan issue, an issue that does not cleave along partisan lines for a lot of reasons that I won't get into now. And in fact, has been more a distinction in which the executive branch, the president has tended to be more, for lack of a better word, liberal on immigration than the legislative or congressional branch. And we see um, that switching around now. So we're in a different historical moment. So I wanna, I wanna bookmark that so that you understand the context that I'm talking about as I zip through a lot of things. And I'm more than happy to take some questions on that. One other piece of that that I think is really critical is that for the entire time period that I'm gonna be talking about in my talk today, there was basically no such thing as an illegal alien. That concept really barely existed. To the extent that it existed at all, it applied to Chinese and Japanese immigrants, mostly Chinese, who almost all of whom had been banned. All working class Chinese had been banned by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which I'm sure many of you know about, and the Gentlemen's Agreement, and, uh, sorry, banned the importation of Japanese laborers in 1907. And the interesting point there, and I'll mention uh, a little bit more about the Border Patrol at the end of my talk, the really important point though, is that there was no Border Patrol until 1924. It was not created until 1924, and its precursor what was were a kind of mounted patrol called Chinese inspectors. And there were literally just a couple dozen of them um, patrolling both the national borders for Chinese immigrants who, like many immigrants today that can't come in by legal means, try to smuggle their way across the um, southern deserts um, or through Canada. So I want to put that front and center because we're talking about a very different situation than today, although we certainly see some similarities and attitudes and reasons why people want to come. So I gave you this brief assignment that I use in my introductory historical methods class about the Bisbee deportation in which 1,200 um, minors who were on strike were rounded up by the county sheriff and his allies. You can see those men carrying guns there. Um, and uh, loaded up into a company owned boxcars, 23 of them, and shipped into the middle of the New Mexico desert. A um, federal investigation ensued. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the president. He was sort of forced to respond. Um, the defenders of the event said that they were protecting a wartime industry from treasonous strikers. The strikers said we were having a peaceful strike, trying to have 
better conditions. They came from 34 different countries. That's why I'm opening with this. This happened three months after the United States entered World War I. And about half of them were um, Mexicans. Now, in other words, there were these folks from all kinds of countries, which is really indicative of the diversity of immigration in uh, the World War I period or before World War I. Um, and the Mexican strikers were um, got paid one half to two thirds what the other men um, did. And one of the things they were asking for was more equal wages. So there's a lot going on there and I open it because it kind of sets the context for the, the fervor around World War I immigration and labor. And also because I was involved in a film called Visby 17 about how the town has remembered it. I've got a link to it at the end. You can see that film on Amazon Prime. It won the American Historical Association's Best Documentary this year, which I'm beyond thrilled about. It's an unusual film. It comes with a discussion guide on PBS's POV series. So it might be something that you might want to take a look at. Okay, but I want to back up and remind you, and somebody I think was from Milwaukee, <laughs> that um, one thing you might hear about in World War I right was the discrimination against um, German Americans right because we were fighting Germany and we always get told these kind of light-hearted stories about that changing the name of sauerkraut to Liberty cabbage changing the name of Frankfurter uh, to hot dog um, but there were more serious components of that the banning of German languages in many many schools the banning of German newspapers um, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is that to this day German is the most common ethnic origin in the United States. So this is a map um, produced by the Census Bureau of the distribution of Germans. You'll see heavy, heavy uh, settlements, St. Louis, Milwaukee, and um, Cincinnati, right? And many people say that the discrimination against German Americans in World War I also helped lead, lead sorry, led to prohibition that people have been fighting for the ban on alcohol uh, for many decades, but the fact that Germans owned the large breweries uh, became another argument for prohibition. Now, my point in showing you this is twofold. On the one hand, compare this to, say, Japanese internment in World War II. German Americans were not interned, um, but they were also the largest um, ethnic group in the United States. So I just want to offer you some context. What are they? They're West Germans. They tended to become very, they were um, skilled and um, were uh, relatively financially successful. So very different from the very poor, for one thing, their Irish counterparts, but very different from the Southern and Eastern Europeans who begin to come in large numbers at the end of the 19th century. And those are the folks I'm really wanting to talk about today. So from about 1881 to 1924, the United States welcomed about 24 million new immigrants. And those immigrants, were interesting and known as new immigrants because um, they came increasingly and predominantly from Eastern and Southern Europe rather than from Northern and Western Europe. So what you're looking at here is numbers in the US Census in each of these years of people of these um, nationalities. So you can see a big growth, for example, in Eastern uh, Europeans in particular, and this would have been mostly Eastern European Jews from 1890 to 1900 to 1910 to 1920. There's a reason why there's almost, there's actually a decline from 1920 to 1930, and that's because of the implementation of the national origins quotas that um, your article by May Nye, who's really the leading historian um, of immigration in the United States, she teaches at Columbia University. And um, she wrote that article. Anyway, so you can see the impact of the um, quotas just in these numbers. And I know that's a lot um, to look at right there. Um, so I'll put that, I'll leave that up for a second. But what I want to suggest to you is what's going on in this period is just starting in 1881, we start getting the first large arrivals of um, Eastern European Jews who are escape, escaping pogroms, um, but also just escaping economic hardship and discrimination, whether or not they're actual victims of violence. And the German, predominantly German Jews in the United States who were already here, were not sure what they thought about these poor, much more religious um, counterparts from Eastern Europe. But they eventually realized that 
discrimination against one Jew is sort of a discrimination against all Jews. And they sort of banded together to try to integrate this group, this increasingly large group into the United States. At the same time, many um, Southern Europeans, Greeks and especially Italians were coming. The number one and number two groups um, in this time period to arrive in the United States were Southern Italians and Eastern European Jews. So if you are of Italian or Eastern European Jewish descent, it's entirely likely, the odds are overwhelmingly large, <laughs> that your ancestors came sometime between 1882 and 1924, as mine did and as my husband's did. Okay, so let me show you the impact of what these immigration flows look like. So I've already told you that I'm gonna tell you about the quotas after World War I, you can see how important and predominant European immigration was in this time period. Now, um, I shared this in a later slide, but it's so important that I'm going to say it now. The main thing, one thing that's very interesting is that United States policymakers, and for the most part, the American public were not very concerned about Mexican immigration at all. Um, the United States did not even keep track of the yearly amounts of people coming across land borders in 19, until 1908. So what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, you can kind of say that a government doesn't care about something unless it counts it. And they didn't think Mexican immigration, the kind that's border crossing, was important enough to even keep track of. Um, and you'll see, by the way, these flows change when, um, as a result of the quotas, and first World War I, right? World War I um, causes a steep decline in immigration because people just are not willing to cross overseas. It's not safe um, and they don't have the means. And then after that, the quotas go into effect. Um, so you can see um, the long-term play. There's lots to talk about here that's post-World War I and unfortunately you don't have time to do it. Okay. So I wrote a book about something called the Dillingham Commission, which was the largest study of immigrants ever conducted in the United States. And if you read the May Nye article carefully, you saw that a guy named Joseph Hill was hired from the Census Bureau to work out that national origins quota system. He had also worked on the Dillingham Commission, and I'm gonna say a bit more about it in a minute. So I say in my book um, that we got immigration restriction, that is the literacy test and the quota laws, which were the first numerical limits on immigration in United States history. I want to emphasize that there were no quotas before the 1924, 1921, and 24 laws. So I say that it took the Dillingham Commission's research and recommendations, plus the red scare of the World War I period, plus the rise of eugenics to create immigration restriction that um, we, I want to underscore, and again, this, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, you can recognize, for good or ill, the immense amount of federal power it takes to regulate and restrict immigration, right? Look at Congress and the president actually disagree on a lot, but they all agree that regulating immigration in the border of grave importance. That actually took a belief in federal power that did not yet exist in 1907, 1911, really before World War I. It really took believing that the federal power, pardon me, the federal government had the right and the power to exercise that much control to yield the kinds of immigration restriction laws that, that followed. Okay. So this is the period, like I said, these folks were known as new immigrants uh, to distinguish from the um, Irish and German and Scandinavians of the mid 19th century. This is a classic picture I'm sure you've all seen right from the Lower East Side. I'm actually giving a talk at the Tenement um, Museum next week. Um, I'm very excited about. If you ever have a chance to go to New York, they do um, really terrific work and I'm giving a similar talk to them next week. Um, my slide seems to be stuck. Hold on. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so the period that I'm talking about, we could kind of call the Ellis Island era, and that's to underscore yet again that this is um, a period that federal regulation of immigration is new. Uh, the United States only created a Bureau of Immigration in the um, Immigration Act of 1882, and it was still run by state officials at state courts. So if you immigrated, if your ancestors immigrated to New York 
that great port of entry in the 19th century, they actually disembarked and were processed at a place called Castle Garden, which is now basically in Battery City, Battery Park City, which was a New York facility. So I like to say that Ellis Island is literally a monument to federal regulation of immigration. It was um, a new law that put more of this under federal control, passed in 1891, and Ellis Island was built to become a federal receiving station. Now, people came to other places too, but it's so indicative, I think, of how we think about the era. I wanna underscore that it, it really is a product of the era. Okay, now let's jump forward to the year 1907, which is an important landmark year. And of course, this is 10 years before the United States enters World War I. So Congress passes a law called the Immigration Act of 1907, and it does a lot of things. Um, it raises the head tax that people have to pay upon arrival. And the idea was not so much at this point that that cost be prohibitive, although some people liked the idea of making it too expensive for people to come easily, but that it was supposed to pay for the Bureau of Immigration, that this Bureau would be self-funded. Um, that also shows you the limits that, that that folks felt about the power of, of the federal government. Uh, it created the Dillingham Commission because Congress and the Senate couldn't agree about whether to have a literacy test. And 1907 is also interesting because um, that law helped create the Gentlemen's Agreement, which banned Japanese laborers from the United States. And also it was the year that marked the largest number of immigrant arrivals yet to date. It was one of these years that people who were increasingly concerned about large numbers of immigrants said, whoa, look at this. Um, and it is the moment at which the 1881 proportion of immigrants from Europe had switched. So in 1881, 80% of new immigrants were still from Western and Eastern Europe, 20% from Southern and Eastern Europe, in 1907, those were exactly reversed. And people were very troubled by these folks who were uh, Catholic or Jewish or Orthodox. They tended to be poorer, and there was a lot of concern about this. Okay, so the Dillingham Commission, as I mentioned, um, was created by Congress. It had um, appointed members, three from Congress, three from the Senate, three experts who were academics, who, who were economists who studied immigration. It had about 350 employees. And actually one thing I discovered, if you're interested in women in uh, World War I, um, a majority of those employees were actually women and they authored several of the reports. The topics of the reports included a wonderful document. You can find all of these on Google Documents or um, on um, Hathi Trust or archive.org. These are great um, to look at. Um, of races or peoples is a lot of fun to look at the way they describe different ethnic groups. They did an undercover investigation of steamship conditions where women and men pretended they were poor peasants and described their experiences. It was an early Me Too document, as you might imagine. The young women traveling alone faced enormous harassment and often assault. They studied every possible avenue of the immigration experience. But their focus, half of their volumes were on immigrants and industries. They decided to focus on the economic impact of immigrants. Here is a form that their hundreds of agents used um, where they would go knock on doors or go to people's factory floors and ask them to fill out these nationality forms. And you'll notice, by the way, this is so interesting. I'm sure you'll enjoy just looking at the different categories. One thing to note, Hebrew was what they called Jews. And there was actually a big big debate about that terminology. Um, also notice to underscore the way things were different there, you'll notice Mexican and no Latin American countries are even listed here. That's why, that's because that was considered a minimal concern. Uh, I know I'm going very quickly, but I look forward to getting your questions. Um, their recommendations included this was the first official recommendation of some sort of quota system. They didn't exactly describe how it would work, but they did suggest that a numerical limit might be worth considering. Their number one recommendation was a literacy test, which had been bandied about in Congress since the 1890s. Its biggest champion was Henry Cabot Lodge, who I'm sure you know, you just talked about Versailles, right, was 
Wilson's chief critic in the Senate, um, Lodge is known for three big things. One, his role in imperialism in the 18th 1990s, two, his opposition to Wilson in the Versailles treaties and joining the League of Nations, and three, for his fervent anti-immigrant uh, legislation and campaign since he was a young man in Congress in the 1890s. The commission recommended a bigger head tax, uh, I'll skip the next one for a second, an Asiatic barred zone that is to continue to limit Asians um, and to do so on a geographical basis. They did something we don't remember much because it didn't really work. They really liked the idea of trying to distribute immigrants around the country. So I know you've got some folks in Louisiana that meant encouraging Italians to go to Louisiana. It meant the attempt at Galveston, Texas to have a port of entry for Jews. Um, they were extremely excited about this idea. It didn't really work. Now, I don't want to mean, I don't mean to say it didn't work at all. Some folks did this. In fact, my Eastern European Jewish um, ancestors immigrated to the Arizona Mexico border, uh, not the Lower East Side of New York. So this did happen, but it didn't quote unquote solve the immigration problem. Now, what do I mean when I say invention of the immigration problem? What I mean to say is that this was a commission that was staffed almost entirely by social scientists, economists, sociologists, social workers. Um, anthropologists, Franz Boas, the very famous anthropologist, worked for them. And they were the nation's first experts, and they'd been hired by the government to solve a problem. And so they saw immigration as a problem. Instead of seeing it as just a fact or a reality or a virtue or a, you know, a positive, they were asked to solve a problem, and so it was a problem. If you see what I mean, there's a little bit of a circular logic there. The other thing is that I think this is one of the most successful commissions, federal commissions ever conducted because almost every single thing, all but like one thing that they recommended actually became policy. Okay, so I gave you that equation earlier in my conversation. So what happens next? Well, uh, World War I breaks out in 1914, as you all know. United States enters in April 1917. There's a typo here, the Bolshevik Revolution. I know all you eagle-eyed um, teachers out there see was actually 1917, not 1919. Um, the Palmer Raids, right, who was um, Wilson's attorney general who became extremely zealous about tamping down on radicalism in the United States, raided uh, radical union offices um, and all kinds of stuff there were. Um, there was a series of bombs that were, um, uh, as you probably know, um, anarchists were blamed. There's a lot going on here, and the Bisbee deportation is an example of some of the social ferment that's around labor, race, radicalism, and immigration. And eugenics, right, race science, is rising in popularity. Now, this is key because a lot of people say that eugenics was sort of full-blown by 1907. I say, I argue eugenics is coming to popularity in this time period. It's not fully developed, and it, it matters because it affects how those quotas actually get organized. So let me move forward on that. In 1916, a man named Madison Grant, uh, a very fancy blue blood New Yorker, lives on Park Avenue, publishes this book, The Passing of the Great Races. And he infamously argues in that book, if you're not previously familiar with it, and please don't have eighth graders who aren't prepared to be sophisticated about race read this. He says things like, when you cross an Anglo-Saxon or a Nordic, who he thinks are, you know, high quality uh, racial individuals. If you cross anyone with a Jew, you end up with a Jew. And so he basically says, and he, he's not just discriminating against Jews, but they stand out. Um, he's basically saying that when you mix a quote unquote higher race with a lower race, you always get the lower race. And so in other words, one, obviously there's a hierarchy of races, but two, that intermixture is mortally dangerous to a society because intermixture results in worse racial stock rather than what we might call assimilation or integration. Um, 
And this is kind of the high point of, of scientific racism in the United States. And by the way, later, and he becomes, you know, a, a quote unquote scientific argument for passing immigration restriction, as well as eugenics laws, like um, laws that, you know, sterilize, that are, require mandatory sterilization of um, people that are considered uh, mentally or physically disabled or criminals and so on. Um, but it also, right, is fuel for the fire for restricting immigration from so-called undesirable countries. He's later discredited because the Nazis love him. They find out that Hitler really likes Madison Grant um, and in the 1930s. And so that's actually one of the reasons why the United States turns away from race, from eugenics later um, as an aside. Eugenics gets an additional push with the rise of IQ testing during World War I, and the um, psychologist Alfred Binet develops the IQ test. Um, Henry Goddard, who's a prominent eugenicist, brings it to the United States, and the U.S. Public Health Service starts giving tests to new immigrants, and these are actually legal formal categories, moron, idiot, imbecile, and begins categorizing people, and this fuels the fire that immigrants are less intelligent than native-born Americans. Now, it turns out that these tests, if you think standardized tests are bad, if you think the SAT is socioeconomically biased, these are beyond ridiculous. And they give them to um, World War I um, draftees, and they include questions like, um, they'll show a picture of a tennis court, and ask you what's missing from this picture. Now, if you are an Eastern European Jew who is a pushcart peddler on the Lower East Side, you might not know that the um, net is missing, right? Because you don't have a lot of time to play tennis, right? But that was considered an IQ test. So clearly they didn't understand the difference between knowledge and intelligence, but the result was that they looked at this results of like close to a million tests they gave and they said, oh, look, immigrants are dumber than other people. I think you can see the problem there. In any case, what we see in 1917 is um, the first piece of legislation besides Asian exclusion that's really meant to limit the number of people to come to the United States. Specifically, it includes the literacy test. And there's a whole list of people who can't come in. I, I mentioned that the categories, the feeble-minded categories, idiot, imbecile, moron, people with epilepsy, people with certain kinds of um, skin disease and eye diseases, um, criminals, anarchists, uh, prostitutes, procurers, that is Johns uh, or pimps, a whole list of categories of people who cannot come to the United States. But all of those are characters or individual qualities. In other words, they're what people call qualitative limitations rather than quantitative, if you, if you understand the distinction. They had to do with your individual characteristics, whether they were inherent or not, but they weren't about overall numbers. The literacy test, although it didn't have a quota, was designed to stop large numbers of people coming to the United States. So it was um, a clever idea that the, the countries that anti-immigrant activists were most concerned about were from Eastern and Southern Europe, which also were the poorest countries with the lowest literacy rates. So the idea was if you passed a literacy test where people had to be literate to come to the United States, and by the way, it's not as bad as it sounds, you only had to be literate in your own language, and they let Jews use Yiddish, which was their spoken language, their vernacular. The idea, though, was that poor countries would have lower literacy rates and they, more of them would be kept out. So it would work as a sieve that kept out the folks that people were most concerned about. Wilson didn't like it. The literacy test is really interesting because it passed Congress five times before it became law because presidents from both parties vetoed it several times. Cleveland vetoed it, Taft vetoed it, and Wilson vetoed it twice. Um, that only adds up to four because I'm not looking at my notes and I can't figure out the fit. I apologize. But anyway, it was um, an example of the executive branch being reticent to anger other countries and actually not sure that they wanted to limit immigration that much. 
So one of the things that, that people liked about the literacy test from a diplomatic standpoint is that it was very awkward to name particular countries that you wanted to ban. This same was true even of Asian exclusion, which was much more popular, but still delicate because the United States wanted to keep good relations with Japan in particular. The United States also had it. Uh, many, many Americans were serving as missionaries or trying to do business in China, and they didn't want to formally anger these countries. So they included this map in the 1917 law, and they mapped out places from which you could not come to the United States. Now, um, it resulted in some quirks, but the point was that way they didn't have to list countries that they were keeping out. I know, I wish I could leave that there because that's a pretty interesting map. Um, and there was a whole interesting discussion in Congress, by the way, about why not ban Africa and why is Siberia not included and some interesting stuff there if you want to ask me questions about it. Okay, so this is just to give you some context. I've talked about most of this. The White Slave Traffic Act was the Mann Act. Those of you who are from New York, we still use the Mann Act. It was used to um, arrest government Governor Elliot Spitzer when he was arrested with a prostitute because he crossed state lines with her. Um, this is, it was famously used against Jack Johnson, the African-American boxer, um, but it was actually a product of concern about um, basically what we would now call sex trafficking. Okay, now here's the meat of my argument. And I, I've, I've not talked a lot about the Palmer Raids and the Red Scare, and I think some of that will come up, I hope, with Professor Papazola. Um, what I want to talk about, right, is these restrictions after World War I. So you have the literacy tests in 1917. It turns out to not be quite as effective as its um, activists had hoped. In the short term, like I mentioned, because of the war, immigration around the world, migration went down. But like many wars, right, it caused a lot of displacement afterwards, particularly right in those places that where the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian and Turkish empires had occurred, the stuff you learned about with Versailles Treaty. In the meantime, because of the rise of more and more eugenics research and funding in the United States, publication of major works like Madison Grants, and also the use of those IQ tests in World War I, which seemed to show that immigrants were less intelligent than other folks. There was increasing fever for formal immigration restriction. Congress hired a man um, named Henry um, Laughlin, Harry Laughlin, sorry, as an eugenics expert in 1920 who testified that immigrants were you know, scientifically racially inferior to Americans and encourage them to pass this law. So Congress passed um, a quota act in 1921, and then it passed a much stricter one in 1924, which was modified and became the Johnson-Reed Act, which went fully into effect in 1929, which you read about, I hope, in the May Nye article. So, Briefly, the way these worked was this. The law in 1921 said that each year, 3% of the population from any given country listed in the 1890 census, sorry, I got that wrong, in the 1910 census, I knew I was gonna mess this up. Okay, it said, take the 1910 census, Let's say there's 5 million Italians in it. I'm making that number up. Okay, you could say 3% of that number each year could come. That would be their quota for each year. It turned out this wasn't nearly restrictive enough, right? Partly because 1910 was after so many Eastern and Southern Europeans had already come to the United States. And so for the folks who wanted to ban Eastern and Southern Europe, Europeans, 1910 was too late. Just think back to that graph that I showed you earlier um, in my talk. So what they decided to do in 1924 is say, okay, we're gonna allow 2% of the number of people from each country in the, 1890, in the 1890 census, and we're gonna have an overall maximum, okay? So in the 1890 census, very few Southern and Eastern Europeans had arrived yet, so a much higher proportion of those folks were Western and, and Northern Europeans. 
Then, as you read in the main nine reading, they modified it yet again, sort of with the same idea, but using this national origin system where they took the 1790 census, they took out African Americans as a group, and they tried to divide the they tried to develop a formula of what the national origins of the United States were and to distribute those quotas um, uh, proportionally. I know I'm not being as clear as I could be, but the upshot is this. If you look at the list of the quotas in the article, you'll see that Eastern and Southern Europe got very, very, very tiny quotas and Western and Northern Europe got very large quotas. And the impact was very immediate. Like I said, almost no Eastern European Jews, Italians, Greeks, or Slavs came after 1924. And so you began to see this rapid decline in, um, in their arrival. And instead you saw a rise. This is really when you see the first significant rise in Mexican immigration to the United States. There are no quotas on Latin American immigration in the United States until 1965, none. All right. Um, I'm missing a slide here. Here we go. Okay, so I've mentioned some things here and I want to underscore then, now, and then I'll stop. So Latin America, all of the Western Hemisphere is exempted from the quotas in 24. They're targeting Eastern and Southern Europeans instead. The Border Patrol is created in 1924. Even the literacy test and the head tax of 1917, which technically applied to all immigrants, the Wilson administration um, agreed to exempt Mexicans during World War I from those rules because they, then as now, very much wanted cheap Mexican labor in agricultural areas and mining areas of the Southwest. And so those folks were exempted from immigration rules until the 1920s. And um, even though they technically required visas, that often didn't happen and there were local border crossing cards. So all of this policy was targeted toward Europeans. It resulted in the total exclusion of Asians, but it paid little attention to Mexican immigration, which is the upshot here, and helped create large numbers of both documented and undocumented Mexican migration after World War one in the 1920s. Um, so I've ended here with a picture, a clip from the film Bisbee 17, which has to do with the Arizona border region in 2017, as well as 1917 to sort of bring us full circle. Um, and then I've got this closing slide here about questions. It looks like you guys already have 56 questions, so I don't need to prompt you on any. Um, feel free to email me, and I also, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Um, so thank you very much. I know I talked really fast. I also have a sore throat, so I have no voice when I get home tonight, but I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Before we get to those questions, I'm just going to do a really quick kind of skills-based uh, discussion, and then we're going to jump into your questions, which I have been writing down and right. throw out some great ones for you. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen, okay. and we will kind of kick off from there. Okay, everyone. So tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about, if I can get to my slides, I wanted to talk a little bit about note-taking. And I know you're all thinking, note-taking, how is, is that really going to, to help in terms of skills? Well, we talk a lot about active reading, but one of the things that we really never talk about is passive listening. And I think that I've seen this more and more over time where you're talking with students and they're listening to what you're saying, but they're not necessarily taking notes. And as, one, as an auditory learner, that's fine. I, I like to listen, but I also like to take notes because it helps me remember things that maybe aren't clear. And so I think note taking is a really great skill, but it's a skill that you really have to practice and hone. Otherwise, you're kind of left with a jumbled mess of words on a piece of paper that may or may not be helpful come right midterm and final exam time. So what can we kind of talk about when it comes to note taking? What do note, why does note taking help us? 
Well, one of the things that we have to remember is that note-taking helps with our retention, right? Students are more likely to remember what's discussed in the classroom if they take notes, because not only are they hearing it, but they're forcing whatever they learn to go through that note process, and so they're remembering it from two kind of outlets. Second, it's going to force students to really organize what they're learning, not only in their head, but on the paper. And that's really key, right? I learned, we all learn a lot of things and when it's coming at us and people are talking to us, sometimes it all kind of gets jumbled in as we're actively trying to make sure that we're listening to everything. So it gives us time to really organize our thoughts in a way that helps us remember what's really key and important. And of course, finally, if that doesn't say it right there enough times, it's repetition, right? It's going to keep reminding us how important these specific points are. So, I'm sure you're all aware there are a million different ways that you can do kind of note taking and introduce into the classroom. Probably the most popular, the most familiar one is the Cornell note taking strategy. Um, you get kind of that broken up section in which you have the note taking column, you have questions that are being asked on that left hand side, and then you have the summary down the bottom. This one is, I know, extremely popular with high school classrooms and college classrooms, and it is a really big hit. Though not everyone is a fan, so I wanted to toss in some different ways that we can strategize. One of the other things that we need to think about when it comes to note taking is to just talk about it in terms of the five R's, record, reduce, recite, reflect, review, right? So if you can get students to think about those five R's, right, it gets them thinking about what do I need to record during the lecture? How can I summarize it? What do I need to pull out that's key? What are the connections that I need to know? And what do I need to review that's really important that I need to remember more than anything else from this, right? Pulling out those main ideas. Then there is another popular one, and I know this is popular, especially with our History Day teachers, right? We have our index note card system, which is also really helpful for students who are pulling secondary and primary sources for research projects, right? Because it gives you that topic in that top left-hand corner, what source it is, what page you found it on, and any paraphrased information that's really key or important. And of course, if students have the quotes that are coming out of various primary sources or secondary sources, right, they can include that instead of the paraphrased information. But then the index cards are just a varying version. Sometimes they're a lot easier to handle and they kind of separate out the notes organizationally in a different way than just say a notebook page. So here are a few other options. This is the split page system, which a lot of people have really um, started doing. And you can do this similarly in a PowerPoint where you, you print out that notes version. So professor's notes or teacher's notes go on one side and then your notes go on the other. And then self-testing is asking questions, asking and reflecting about things, right? So it kind of juxtaposes them on either side, especially this is really great if students kind of want to split what the teacher is talking about and what they're saying so they can see them side by side, but it's not as stuck to one page as other options. You can also do discussion columns in which questions go to the left, professor comments go in the middle, and then students' comments go on the side, right? So it's giving you those like three distinct things that students need. Your comments, which are important, their comments and what they're learning, and any questions that they have, right, in regards to the material. Of course, and I really enjoy the T method one. I think it is really great, especially when I'm working with um, middle school students. It's got the notes at the top and then down the bottom is that big spot for a summary, so pulling out those key points, and then a spot for questions. And, or if you're into it, I know that mind maps have become a bigger thing. Um, I am not a mind map <laughs> friend, mainly because that actually looks like the inside of my brain. And so, but I think that is an, an option. And I think for students who have a really creative mind and a knack for mind maps, it really helps them plug out how things intersect and connect and branch off of. And it helps them form those connections. So if you haven't worked with mind maps, check them out. They're really interesting. All right, and of course, we live in a digital age, 
and we deal with students who are very much attached to their, um, their laptops and their tablets and their phones. So there are digital note-taking apps that are really great. Microsoft's OneNote, uh, Padlet, Evernote, and Google. Um, Google has just great options in general if you just want them taking notes in Google Docs. Um, Microsoft OneNote is kind of their version of that. Um, I use that one a lot because it lets you put in separate notebook pages but keeps them all attached. And then Padlet actually works like um, little post-it notes, but digitally, and you can actually branch the post-it notes together to kind of connect them and make notes off of that. And Evernote is a similar version of an app that you can download onto your laptop and work with as well. So the, if you prefer to let them be a little more tech with their notes, these are some great options that will auto-save and make sure that they don't lose said notes. So what do we have to consider when we're taking notes? Well, one, we want to fingers crossed hope that they are organized and hopefully some of the methods that I showed you before will help students keep things organized. But we also have to be consistent. And I mean that in two ways. One, if we're going to make students take notes, make them take the notes every time. Um, that way it kind of gets them into the habit of notes are important and I should be taking them even if my teacher didn't tell me specifically to take notes. But also, if it's going to help them be consistent in how they're taking notes, right? So if you have a special version that you really like, whether it's the Cornell or the index cards or mind mapping, try to be as consistent and possible as, what, as possible in what you're using, right? Students kind of get into that habit, and so the easier it is to keep them on track is to keep that how they take their notes consistent from kind of day to day. Also, one of the things that I really like about the different um, kind of options is that they almost all of them include a place to put questions, right? And I think that if we're gonna ask questions and be told that active reading is really important and we're going to be kind of asking questions of primary and secondary sources, we should be asking, note, asking questions of our notes of what our teacher is saying. If we're at a lecture, what is the lecturer saying, right? It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to say, do I understand what is being said, right? Do I, did I understand everything that my teacher said or did I miss a name, right? All of these are important. So it's always a good idea to have questions in there because that way we know what we understood and what we didn't understand. And of course, I think one of the biggest things that notes help us do is to help students understand the difference between main ideas and details. I'm sure that every one of you knows, and I was this kid, I could read a book and tell you every single detail out there that there was. I could probably bury the main point in there and you wouldn't know what it was. I probably wouldn't know what it was. And I think that notes help students understand that while details are important, we need to differentiate between what's the main idea and what's a detail right? Because those things are very different and they're hopefully, if we know what those main ideas are, we know what the overarching theme of the, course, or the class that we're taking or what our teacher is trying to help us understand. And of course, I thought this was just a really great graphic in terms of, of how notes are useful. And this one comes out of the University of New South, uh, New South Wales uh, in Sydney, Australia. But these are what notes should really help students be doing. Understanding key concepts and main points. What are key examples? Do, are there words that my teacher used that I don't understand, right? What new vocabulary am I learning? Obviously, any references, right? What sources are we talking about? Where can I find them? Is it a primary source or a secondary source, right? Again, that questions piece. What did I understand? What didn't I understand? Why am I having a problem with it if there is a problem? What do I need to know? And of course, lastly, what are your thoughts and questions and ideas relating to what you're taking notes on? Because that's going to really, that piece is going to really help students make connections to what's key and what they should be taking away. And of course, I wanted to talk about two ways that you can really work this into a classroom to show students that kind of notes are important. And one of the ways that you can do that is through an assignment. Um, when I originally started out <laughs> teaching, I used to give the 
five point quiz based off of what students had read. And I noticed that they either did really well or they did not do really well. And I decided to, ch uh, to change it up and suggest to them that I wanted a two page outline based on what they read. I didn't want less than two pages. I didn't want more than two pages. Again, trying to teach them to see if they could pull out those main kind of concepts, but making that the assignment. And I noticed, at least in my experience, it was helping students retain more when it came to taking that midterm and that final. They were much more prepared because they had actually had to do the reading, right, and put those notes to paper. So that's kind of a key way to kind of check in and make sure that notes are kind of doing their job. And I think one of the other ways that you can do this, just as a really quick kind of end activity in class, is to do what I like to call a five minute pause. And at the end of the notes, I make students flip to the, another piece of paper and write down the major main points and three key things that they learned from the lecture that they hadn't known before. Because again, it's gonna force them to actually sit there and think about what you said. Write it down and try and figure out what those main points are. And hopefully, they'll take a look at that before you test them on what they are doing. So that's kind of a quick introduction to kind of why notes could be important in your class and hopefully you'll consider using some of these ideas or um, models and um, let me know how it goes if you do. So one last thing, write down the URL please. This is our survey so that you can do it at the end. Um, if you run into any problems, don't worry, I will send it out after we are done here. But I'm gonna take this time to um, throw some questions to Dr. Benton Cohen. So everyone bear with me while I pull up some of your questions and um, hopefully she will come and join us. Hi, you ready to do some questions? Yeah, I snuck a peek at some of them and was writing some answers. <laughs> some more. I was so excited. I already know how to take notes. <laughs> I hope so. My son just got tested on Cornell note taking at his school. <laughs> great, just so you all know. His notes are great. I was pretty impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there we go. Actual evidence that, yay, someone is taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> his mom is a history professor, admittedly. But. All right, well, you said you were starting to answer some of them, but I guess I'm going to throw out a couple of questions to you and um, you can kind of answer them live. Okay. All right, um, so one of the questions out there is, why is a quota introduced on Latin American immigration in 1965? That's a really important question. Um, the reason is, in 1965, the Heart Seller Act is passed, which has been getting a lot of attention recently because it had its you know, 50th anniversary a few years ago, and it's controversial. The Heart Seller Act was a really landmark piece of legislation. So if you want to, I mean, the big turning points in immigration history are basically 1882, which was Chinese exclusion, 1924, which was the quota, the Johnson Reed Act, and 1965, which was the Heart Seller Act. Um, and what the Heart Seller Act did is it equalized all of the quotas. So JFK, before he died, very much wanted to end the discriminatory quota system, and it wasn't just him. In fact, Harry Truman had two presidential commissions that recommended ending the quotas, and there was a lot of reasons for this, including that after World War II and the horrors of Nazi Germany became more evident to the American public, and the, the influence of American eugenics on Nazi thinking was horrifying to many people and embarrassing. And they realized that the quotas were a reflection of discrimination. And um, Truman really wanted to get rid of the quotas, but he failed. Um, he couldn't get Congress to change them up in part because in the Cold War, there were lots of members of Congress who were afraid of um, letting too many people in from Eastern Europe. And by the way, I just taught this to the undergrads. This could cut both ways. This is an interesting feature of attitudes about immigration during the Cold War. Um, the United States ended its ban on naturalization um, and theoretically immigration of Asians um, for, for diplomatic reasons during World War II. Um, 
Truman was of the mindset that we should get rid of the discriminatory quotas that favored some countries over other countries because he thought it would look better on the global stage and that if we became a haven to freedom seeking Eastern Europeans trying to leave the Iron Curtain, that this would actually be a net positive. But there were other people in the Cold War in the United States who said, yeah, but we don't want to let in people from Eastern Europe because they might be communists. So you could see that that argument could go either way. I haven't forgotten Mexicans in 65. So in 1965, that landmark legislation made the quota for every country in the United States the same. Now, this is a perfect example of the difference between equality and equity or equality of opportunity versus outcome. It looks fair. Right? It looks fair to give every country um, a quota. And the way it worked is that every country had a quota of 20,000 people per year, and there was a max um, of about 600,000. Um, however, if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? So Botswana, Germany, China, and Mexico all have the same quotas technically speaking. Now, obviously, no matter what your views, it's clear that we have a different geographical and historical relationship with Mexico than we do with those other countries. It's not realistic to have a quota that small. But anyway, the idea was to give every country a quota because the Western Hemisphere had been left out. Now, some of you may know the majority of people who come to the United States now don't come as quota immigrants. They come as what, as um, for family reunification or other visas. Um, and I'm not talking about undocumented. I'm talking about other measures that are allowed. That's a whole other story. But anyway, 1965 is when all of the quotas were quote unquote regularized. Okay. All right. So um, they want to know if any of the other countries around the world had similar commissions or quotas. After. Yes, terrific question. I'm so glad you asked that. So there is a very rich literature now. One of the most robust fields, subfields in immigration history is about Asian exclusion around the world and in what we call what have come to be known as white settler nations. So those are places that were basically white colonies. So the United States, Canada, Australia, and even to some extent, Brazil and Argentina, which were receiving countries, and what and New Zealand, um, what these scholars have found is that Asian exclusion began to proliferate around white settling nations all around the, late, the same time in the late 19th century. The first people in the world who had to have passports were Asians. The origins of requiring passports go, date to the Asian exclusion era. And that happened largely in concert with each other including there's a historian in Erica Lee who argues that the United States basically pressured Canada and China to create Asian exclusion programs somewhat similar to ours for the reasons that you might guess because if our neighboring nations didn't exclude Asians it was too easy for Asians particularly Chinese to come to the United States. Um, the Dillingham Commission actually wrote a whole volume on immigration conditions in other countries and the countries they were referring to were receiver countries um, that report included Brazil, Argentina, Canada, and Australia, I think, all of whom received large numbers of immigrants. They did not have quotas in the same way, but it is true that starting to think about limiting immigration became a global phenomenon at the, around the same time. All right. Um, so we have a couple of questions about how kind of the census was done in yes. the 90s. So how did kind of how were they able to fill out the forms and depending on, of course, in question to this literacy rate issue and how did that affect the accuracy? OK, so I'm sorry, I'm mixing up the literacy. Can you divide that into? Sure. Um, so they would like to know kind of how the census was done and if certain based on who is able to answer said census oh right i saw that question okay yeah so the census um oh it says you know what can i share because i pulled up a picture of a census because you're sharing sure okay so you have to end share sharing. for me to share i'm told all right amazing okay i'm going to share with y'all this is a 1790 census form can you see it yes so you first of all can picture this guy joseph hill combing through this thing trying to figure it out right i mean you had helpers but so the way that the census worked to be honest was not terribly different than it works now and i understand the question was about whether people were literate and how do you fill out the form somebody knocked on your door 
and asked you questions. And then as now, it could be wildly inaccurate. And I'm sure in this classroom of 60 people, we have some genealogists. And you know, if you go on Ancestry, you'll find lots of different spellings of names, ages that don't match up. So two things were in play. One, people might not be literate, which wasn't a huge deal if the census taker was literate. But two, this is something people don't think about. We're very wedded to our birthdays, right? Like we know when they are. You're, you're in trouble if you don't remember a loved one's birthday. A lot of people didn't pay that much attention to their birth date or year until after the Social Security Act, because it didn't really matter how old you were when there wasn't mandatory retirement and you didn't get Medicare or Social Security at a certain age. So people didn't pay the same attention to dates as we do today. And so a lot of times people didn't really know exactly how old somebody was. I know that sounds crazy, but it's actually true. It could also happen that like you're at the factory working or you're out in the fields harvesting and your nine-year-old daughter answers the door and she answers the questions and she doesn't know everything. Or you're middle or upper class and your servant answers the door. So like any data, there's a lot of um, imperfections in it. But some, some censuses are better than others. Now I'm showing 1790 was the first federal census. It's in the... Um, the reason why is because it's actually in the Constitution to do a census every 10 years. Um, some of the censuses were better than others. Um, but yeah, basically it's a guy or woman later walking around and asking you questions. So th this is a picture of the 1791. I'll, I'll pull up a picture of a 1910 one while you're asking the next question. Sure. All right, the next question is, what role did anti-Semitism play in immigration policy after the war? Ooh, that's a really complicated question. <laughs> I mean, like way too complicated to explain briefly here, but worth talking about. Um, let me just show you, I just want to show you this because I, the 1910 census is the one they ended up using right at some point. This, this is how they look and you can see that it's printed. Hold on. I know you can't see it yet. Give me a sec. Um, share. I'll just leave it up while I'm talking about this question. Here we go, because I think they're cool. Um, can I answer one other question that actually has to do with this census really quickly? And then sure. I'll answer that. Okay, so one thing that's super, super interesting about, let me move this, about the 1910 census, and it has to do with somebody pointed out this issue of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and Mexicans being um, US citizens. Let me clarify around that. So Mexicans that were in the part of the Southwest that became the United States, that's correct. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo gave them the right to quote unquote elect to take US citizenship. Dual citizenship wasn't a thing, um, but they could become US citizens. Now this was before the 14th Amendment, um, which um, guaranteed citizenship regardless of race. I won't get into the details, but the upshot is that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo basically made Mexicans legally white because you had to be white to become a naturalized citizen in 1848. And so that meant that if the treaty allowed people to be citizens, it meant they were white, if you see what I'm saying here. Now, I happen to just Google a page of the 1910 census, happens to be from California, and there's somebody Mexican-American in here and they're listed as white. Manuel Machado, if you see here, his category is white down here at the end. But I can tell you that a lot of census takers, even though they got instructions to mark Mexicans as, as white, would mark them as M. And I actually found census from 1910 and 1920 in Arizona, where whole names of Mexican people or Mexican Americans were listed as M and then the supervisor went through and turned those cursive M's into W's. <laughs> okay, so just to show you that just because something's legally true doesn't mean people treat it as true. Okay, so uh, I just had to share that because that's one of my favorite fun facts. Um, Anti-Semitism after the war. So a couple important things about that. One, 
if you read the May 9 article and you looked at the quotas, you'll notice Germany had a very large quota. Well, that's because remember, German was the most common national origin in the United States. Not in 1790, I will admit, it was English, but nevertheless. The problem was that Jews in Germany who tried to come to the United States during World War II while the quotas were still in effect, almost none of them were allowed to because they had to have a visa to leave Germany. So the Nazi government would not let them leave. And so what happened is that thousands of those empty quota slots for Germany went unfilled. Tell you something else, totally fascinating. At the time, there was a symbolic quota for Asian countries, in particular China. There was a quota of 100 a year. But because of Asian exclusion, that quota could not be filled by people who were of Chinese racial origin. So follow me here. The country of China had a quota of 100, but actual people of Chinese descent were ineligible because of the ban on Asians. So other people could fill that, like English in Hong Kong. But some Jews actually got out and moved to China and immigrated to the United States by doing that. Others did it by going to Cuba, the Dominican Republic. But mostly what happened is that the European quotas didn't fill because the Jews couldn't leave Europe. Not, um, so the problem was on that end. Now, I don't mean to get the United States off the hook. Many of you probably know there was tremendous anti-Semitism in the State Department, people that were really avowed anti-Semites. I'm sure many of you know the story of the ship, the St. Louis, that had Jewish children on it that was turned away at port. There were many efforts to relax the quotas, to let more Jews in during World War II, and those congressional efforts failed. After the war, we still have, remember, we still had the quotas till 1965. In 1948, Congress passed the Displaced Persons Act, which was designed to allow what we would now call refugees from places that were torn apart by World War II to come, largely from Eastern Europe. Although on its face, that law looks like it was directly designed to bring German and Polish Jews to the United States. In fact, the rules that it required for displaced persons favored people who were non-Jews. They didn't say that, but they were written. For example, it favored farmers. Well, very few Jews were farmers, okay? Um, so most of the people who came as displaced persons actually came from Eastern Europe and were Slavs. So I have a friend who's half Macedonian and half Serbian. His parents were born in a displaced persons camp and then immigrated with their parents um, after the war. Okay, so um, in terms of a kind of European descent, when do we start to see kind of the lumping of all people of European descent coming together as a group as opposed to singling out, say, the Italians and other groups? So that's a good question too. And I would say, so one thing that happened, are you guys sharing me now? You see my my picture here we can i'm back on the slides um yeah. no we're we're seeing your um we're seeing we're still seeing the census page oh you are oh because i have to share i have to do a new share okay hold on here we go ready now is it yep okay so um i mentioned that immigration from eastern southern europe pretty much ended after 1924 and what you began to see was that cliche some of you may know if you belong to one of these ethnic groups, like the first generation speaks the language and eats the food, the second generation doesn't want to have anything to do with that, moves to the suburbs, the third generation gets interested again and goes and, you know, marches in the Irish parade, in the St. Patrick's Day parade, or goes to Little Italy, whatever, right, whatever the cliche. Um, an identity by the 30s, 40s, and 50s began to develop of the idea of the white ethnic. And the white ethnic were the Itals, Italians and Jews and Greeks and Slavs who eventually, because they're legally white and they don't face the same kind of discrimination as African Americans do, begin to move in the sub, into the suburbs and to integrate with 
quote unquote old stock Americans to some degree. And I wouldn't say that there's an identification as European in the United States, it's an identification as white, right? Even now, I think when people talk about European immigration, they wanna know, are you talking about somebody who's English or Irish? Are you talking about somebody who's Serbian? What are you talking about, you know? But in the United States, what happened is they basically just became white. All right, so we're kind of riving off of that question. We have quite a few people writing in kind of asking, again, who falls under this classification? So someone wants to know, do, where do Puerto Ricans fit into all yeah. of this? Are they, yeah. are they technically counted as immigrants or not? No, they are not immigrants. They are citizens of the United States as of 1917 and they are, um, what did they call them? Something like resident nationals before that. I have a PhD student who's defending his dissertation on Puerto Rico next Monday. Uh, Puerto Ricans are adamantly not immigrants. They are Americans, but they're often treated as immigrants, not, I mean, there's a quota for them. They can come and go as they want. They don't fall under the immigration law regime, but obviously they face discrimination. They do similar kinds of jobs that immigrants do. Um, and a kind of more interesting example, I mean, Puerto Ricans are interesting because they are sort of insider outsiders um, and they have to migrate to come to the United States, right? But they're not legally immigrants. A different example, but related, if you want to think about kind of a, a Venn diagram of citizen, non-citizen, immigrant, non-immigrant, are Filipinos. Because when the United States had control of the Philippines after the new imperialism of the 1890s, Filipinos, again, also were not immigrants. But people had a lot more concerns. They didn't love Puerto Ricans, but they had a, a lot, many white Americans had grave concerns about Filipinos whom they considered Asian. And they were like, well, we banned Asian immigration. Why are we allowed it in the Filipino? And the answer was because Filipinos were not immigrants. But they actually, so they started coming in large numbers after 24 because of um, the decline in, in European immigrants at the same time that Mexican immigrants came. And then they were told they couldn't come anymore once they were gonna have independence in 42. So Filipinos actually had the situation of being non-immigrants and then becoming immigrants who were excluded. Um, and so there were sort of two separate generations ge divided by decades of, of Filipino immigrants. Okay, so one of the teachers wants to know, are there, are there any active immigration advocates at this time? And yes, do they, I, they have success? These are wonderful questions. That's a terrific question. There's a brand new book by a woman named Madalena Marinari um, about Jewish and Italian immigration advocates after the restrictions. So Jewish, uh, Jewish and Italian Americans who lobbied for inclusion and fair policies after the exclusion laws. There's also, and there's a chapter about this in my book on the Dillingham Commission, the book called Inventing the Immigration Problem, the, the, the sort of, how do I say this, the oldest um, Jewish lobbying organizations in the United States, so the American Jewish Committee and um, to some extent, the Nay Brith, um, some other organizations basically were founded to fight immigration restriction in the early 20th century. And the question of anti Semitism is an interesting one because there was definitely anti Semitism, but to be honest, and I say this as a Jew, they were not. Some of that anti-Semitism was not as severe as you might think, which is to say, take the literacy test. And I mentioned it allowed Hebrew. Sorry, it allowed Yiddish, which was the vernacular language of working class poor Jews. So it was already pretty um, generous to let them do that. I mean, it was a law meant to limit people. So generosity you have to put in context, but nevertheless. Also, Jews were highly literate. So the literacy test didn't stop very many of them, right? Like that's the stereotype, they're people of the book. Their religion requires literacy. So, um, and women sometimes were illiterate, but women didn't have to pass the literacy test if their husband passed it. And women's citizenship was also dependent on their men, on, on husbands. So 
there was a lot of anti-Semitism. There's no question about it. It was one of the things that fueled immigration restriction. But it's also the case that I think many of the elite, the elites were not as anti-Semitic as, I guess, as here's how I want to say it, as they could have been. <laughs> um, and for example, those prominent Jewish organizations in the early 20th century actually had a hearing um, with the Dillingham Commission, a live hearing. They were the only group to have a live hearing with the commission. And what they did at that hearing was say, we don't want you to call us Hebrews. We want you to call us Jews. Um, they also wrote a statement to the commission saying, your whole, whole formulation of immigration as a problem is wrong. Immigration is good. Immigration is part of the American fabric and is essential. And so we reject your premise. Interesting. Okay. So, um, do you think that teachers can use the events of immigration to Europe by people from Asia and Africa and the response of European countries to tie immigration after World War I to kind of current, the current atmosphere and time? Okay, so here's what I say. I think it would be a service to every person living in the United States to make clear that when people came in these large numbers, they didn't have to worry about whether they were quote unquote legal or illegal, right? Because that's a huge difference from now. It's one thing if people say, well, my great, -grandpa my great grandfather came legally, why can't people come today? Well, that's because the laws were completely different, right? As long as you, I mean, with a serious asterisk for Asians, um, other than Asian peoples, most people before 1924 could come. And even though there's a lot of nervousness about the requirements at Ellis Island, just to use as an example, 98% of the people who arrived at Ellis Island got through. Only 2% were turned away. Um, they largely did not follow a policy of, ex of separating children from their families. Um, so what I wanna say is that I think comparison is really useful. And in particular, there was a slide I ended up not including um, that, let me go back to this early one. If you look at, um, this slide doesn't do it quite as well because the lines are broken up, but there are wonderful graphs that show you that 1910 and 2010 had basically around the same percentage of people, foreign born people in the United States. It, was a, it almost hit 15% by 1910 and it was about 13.7 or something in, 20, in 2008. So there's a lot of similarities um, in, in the percentage of Americans who are immigrants. But what I do wanna say is that obviously this issue impacts some children and their families much more than other families. So you do have to be really cautious. I mean, I don't wanna tell you how to do your business because you guys know what your classrooms are like, but you, what you really wanna be careful about is like, don't do role playing. <laughs> Please do not do role playing because you do not wanna be in a situation where you have children calling each other names, right? Or making assumptions about them or their backgrounds. Um, but I do think that you certainly can compare the reasons why people came to the United States then, the arguments against immigrants, the percentage of the country that were immigrants. You certainly can compare those from then and now. Okay. And also riffing off of that, um, the same teacher also wants to know, can we, can we talk about that current situation in, in kind of Europe in which some countries are kind of barring immigrants in terms of that as well? And we're seeing that kind of crop up. Well, I guess my question is, what is it that you want them to get out of that, right? So I always, I think, like, I'm a big free speech person, but I also want to say, like, what's the goal of the conversation? What's the, what's the learning about history goal of the conversation? Because, uh, yes, I think talking about how immigration challenges a lot of nations' conceptions of themselves is really important. For me, I mean, I wouldn't hide any information from students, but by the same token in my limited class time, I guess the one, that example, or at least the way it was couched, I'm a little afraid. I don't want it to be like, so everyone does it, so it's normal, you know? Like we don't want to normalize certain things that might be of the moment. Um, so I'm not sure. I'd have to know more about the context. Okay. Well, maybe that teacher will reach out to you on your email and be able to chat about that a little more. So we're getting, getting close to time. So I'm going to round off this last question. Um, and then we're going to 
um, kind of throw up that link again for you on feedback and, and get you guys kind of off to the rest of your night or if you are on the other side of the world, off to your morning. So this last question is, what kind of intersection took place between more traditional racism in the American South and kind of the xenophobic anti-immigrant sentiments after the war as reflected in organizations like the Ku Klux Klan? Oh, that's a super question. So that's somebody who obviously knows a little bit about the Klan that you know the second Klan was anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish, um, was anti-immigrant as well as anti-African American. So that's actually a terrific topic that I think would be wonderful to address with your classes. And the reason for this is that it's complex. Um, there's not a clear answer. So on the one hand, you see that the second rise of the KKK in this era, you know, the KKK reaches its, its heights at exactly the time when the quota laws get passed. So it's absolutely influential. They're totally influenced by eugenics. By the same token, 10 years earlier, this is totally fascinating and something I emphasize in my book, the region of the country most open to immigration was the South. The South was underdeveloped, it was underpopulated, African Americans were beginning to move to the North and white employers, plantation owners, factory owners were worried about the so-called labor problem. What they called a labor problem was African Americans seeking more rights, right? And they had many schemes to recruit Italians, um, uh, Czechoslovakians, um, a variety of ethnic groups to the South to replace African-American workers. And this is the main reason why there's a lot of Italians in Louisiana today. Um, also, anti-Semitism was much worse in the Northeast than it was in the West and the South. So just to name one example, Greenville, Mississippi, a, a true like center of the Delta South had a Jewish mayor in the early 20th century. Um, so Shelby Foote, the famous um, Civil War novelist, I think his grandmother or grandfather was Jewish. He's from that town. So the answer is it's complicated. And what that makes it interesting to study. Why did they feel in one way about something and in another way about something? And also, why did the South change its views about immigrants so quickly? Those are things that students could look at documents and think about and even do a National History Day project on. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and I want to thank Dr. Benton Cohen for talking to us about immigration. And if you have more questions for her, um, feel free to email her. She's given you that cue, so go for it. And I also want to thank the World War I Centennial Commission for funding this webinar series and really getting us to talk about kind of the impact of World War I, which I think we all need to talk about just a little bit more. So again, if you have any questions, keep throwing them in there and I will try and collect them and get them over to Judge Benton Cohen as well. But we are all set for that night and I am just gonna share my screen one more time so that you have that that URL, do not forget to do your survey, okay? So there it is right there. If you run into any problems, don't worry, I will be sending you out. But thank you everyone for joining and get ready to talk about module four and we'll see you all in December. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you.